So I realize that there's a lot of people that believe that a ketogenic diet will eradicate cancer. And in the same vein, fasting will also eradicate cancer. Well, as you'll see, that may not always be the case. But as I've said many times before, we wouldn't want nuance to get in the way of the blinding light of simplicity. Still, I'll dare to introduce this brand new detailed study indicating the potential harm of a ketogenic diet for cancer. But it isn't all bad news, as I'll explain. You may have heard of a famous researcher by the name of Dr. Otto Warburg, who over 100 years ago discovered that cancer cells preferentially use glucose, that's blood sugar, for energy. Then, many decades later, other scientists have taken that foundational idea and further substantiated it. Even recently, there's been uh, quite a push to recognize cancer as a metabolic disease. While that whole arc is a little beside the point here, it does tell us that there's plenty of research and well-accepted research that indicates that cancer cells feed on glucose. On the other hand, there's been a hard swing in the opposite direction. Then if cancers prefer glucose, why not just reduce the glucose that cancer has access to? And why not use an alternative fuel source that the rest of our body can use, but presumably cancer can't? And that is ketones. Ketones metabolize molecules produced by our liver when we fast for long periods of time or stick to a very strict, very low carbohydrate, i.e. ketogenic diet, are produced from fat. And given what I mentioned previously, it makes sense that they'd be unusable or difficult to use by cancer cells, giving us the metabolic upper hand. However, something that cancer biologists know that the public doesn't generally consider is that tumors abnormal masses of cancer cells have different requirements depending on which section of the tumor that you're looking at. For example, some areas of a tumor can be vascularized quite well, meaning blood flow containing glucose, oxygen, and more flows to those cells quite easily, offering a non-stop flow of nutrients. However, in the very same tumor, another section can be poorly vascularized. So less of everything arrives. In such a case, within the same tumor, the same types of cancer cells can need different things, as well as react to different stimuli. So what I'm trying to say in now fewer words, cancer is way more complex than is often explained. Taking that background into account, when we look at cancer cells, we can split them into two categories. To be clear, we could divide them into many more categories, but we'll stick to these two for now. One category is called adherent cells. The second category is called a tumor initiating cell. The adherent cells tend to make up the bulk of the tumor and the tumor initiation cells make up the minority. Now think of it like a, like a beehive. The majority of the bees, the worker bees, are the adherent type of cancer, and the queen bee is the middle of the hive. The worker bees, the adherent cancer cells, divide very quickly and keep growing the tumor, but if the entire tumor was destroyed, it would be the queen bee, the tumor initiation cancer cell, that could recreate the entirety of a new tumor. They're rare but powerful cancer cells. Now, another one of their powers is their metabolic flexibility, meaning if the blood supply changes or the nutrient delivery changes, they can adapt extremely well. So when we look at the tumor growth in human tumors, the higher the lines go, the larger the cancerous tumor. And we see that those exposed to a ketogenic diet defined as only 3% of the diet coming from carbohydrates and almost 60% from dietary fat, there is a rapid acceleration of the tumor. You can see the images of the excised tumor on the left, non-ketogenic exposed up top and ketogenic exposed on the bottom. There's clearly a size difference. So the main point up to now is that a ketogenic diet applied to patient tumors leads to faster tumor growth. Now, the reason for that accelerated growth is due to the specific effects that ketones have on these tumor initiation cancer cells. They tend to speed up their growth. In fact, these cancer cells become, in a manner of speaking, addicted to ketones, not just because they use them for energy generation, but also because they can reroute these ketones to be used in building blocks for the generation of fat to create cell membranes for the cells called lipogenesis. 
but there's a critical defining feature that makes this more or less of a problem. That feature is the cell's production of a transport protein and its stabilizing protein that allow ketones into the cell. For your cells to even allow ketones into them to be used, in this cancer case, we're talking about energy generation as well as lipogenesis to produce more cell membranes, they must have a gateway to enter the cell through the cell membrane. That protein is called MCT1, and it's stabilized by a protein called CD147. And you don't need to know the names, just know that there's a transporter that allows ketones into the cell to be used. So it makes logical sense that when we look at tumors, we can assess their dependence or eagerness to rely on ketones for energy. And when looking at normal lung tissue versus cancerous lung tissue from the tumor, there are elevated levels of these proteins. Now beyond that, and more suggestive of a potential unique effect, when looking at people with cancer, we see striking findings. This is a survival curve. So all you need to know is that if the lines are higher up and further to the right, that's better survival from cancer. The red line is the people with lung cancer that has high expression or levels of these ketone transport proteins. And the black line is those with similar cancer but lower expression of these proteins. Clearly, the presence of these proteins could mean something. One, this tells us that there may be a unique harm for those with cancers that express high levels of these ketone transport proteins. Two, it also tells us that a ketogenic diet may not be universally negative as it may depend on the expression of these proteins. The main point here is that ketones are used by some cancer cells for energy generation and for the generation of fat molecules to be used in the creation of new cell membranes, i.e. new cancer cells. And beyond that, some of this may depend on if the cancer produces a lot of these ketone gateways. Okay, let me pause here and also mention that this association is a simple one. There may be other reasons that these people experience faster cancer progression, but in the totality of evidence, it fits with the direct evidence presented throughout this study. So where does that leave us? What do we make of all this? Well, let me get into that next, but if you're looking for a more detailed analysis, getting into the mitochondrial aspects of these cancer cells and what happens when we block these transport proteins or even what researchers are starting to hint toward in relation to how to approach these cancers, I cover all that in the extended analysis that I offer in an extended video format like what you're watching right now, but also in an article and even in a podcast format. That's all included for the Physionic Insider member, plus all these benefits right here. If you're interested, check out the Physionic Insiders membership in the description. I hope to see you there. This leaves us in a seemingly off situation because on one hand, there are also studies that show that ketogenic diets and generally raising ketones like fasting can diminish tumor growth. And yet we then see studies like this one and there are others that indicate worse outcomes. So how do we reconcile those differences? Well, for one, these studies tend to look at different forms of cancer. The cancers where ketogenic diets seem helpful in combating cancer are certain pancreatic cancers and colon cancers. Meanwhile, glioblastomas, melanomas, and as we saw here, lung cancers are better off without ketones present. So could the type of cancer be the defining feature? It seems a strong possibility at least. Second, a lot of these studies, including this one, rely on mouse data. So we went over some human data, but even then, it was simple associations and mechanisms, so we need more translational evidence. I'm not sure how feasible that will be considering the ethics, but maybe there's a way around that. Here's what I make of it. A ketogenic diet is still a perfectly viable path to use in general health and even against cancer. I don't think that these data are enough to dissuade against that. However, I would be cautious believing that a ketogenic diet is the solution to all cancers and making sure if you have cancer, that the data tends in the direction that your diet choice is beneficial in combating that specific cancer. Now here we saw mechanistic and weak associative evidence that a ketogenic diet accelerates certain lung cancers. Certainly more direct clinical data is needed to confirm these findings. But speaking of cancer, there's plenty of other material on how to think and deal with cancer that I go over right here. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I deeply appreciate it. I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye.